Great rising, everybody. How y'all doing out there? This is another special interview on the scene. EUTV Wom's on the scene. And hey, listen, I'm here with the group of brothers that are outstanding. I'm very proud of them, definitely, because they represent my brotherhood, my fraternal order of brothers that come straight from the community that has decided to solve our own community problems and stand up for what's wrong in our community and right those wrongs through actions, good deeds, and righteousness. And I'm here with the You Can Committee uh, from the Circle of Brotherhood, which stands for United Community Assistance Network. United Community Assistance yes. Network. And um, it is a pleasure to be here with you brothers. And just let me give y'all some background about You Can. You Can is the committee uh, is a committee of the Circle of Brotherhood, black men solving their own community problems. One of the problems in the black community, as well as communities around the world, is substance dependency, substance abuse, use of um, drugs and narcotics. But substance could be anything. So we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about that too in a minute. Uh, substance dependency. The Circle of Brotherhood formed the committee to address this problem that plagued the world as well as the United States. However, right now. We are focusing on Miami, Florida with this initiative and with this movement. So from my right to left, I want you brothers to introduce yourselves to the people, starting with your brother. Kyle. I'm Brother Benal, I'm a member at large of Circle Brotherhood and the UCAN committee. Uh, I'm anxious to get started with this interview, so let's do it. That's what it is. Um, brother James Hill. Uh, member of the Circle of Brotherhood, member at large of the Circle of Brotherhood, uh, and also the Secretary of uh, UCAN. Brother yes. Mustafa, member at large of the Circle of Brotherhood, also uh, Vice President of UCAN. Chaplain Stanley Young, uh, Circle of Brotherhood, member at large, uh, Treasurer of the UCAN Committee. Dennis Phillips, uh, executive member of the Circle of Brotherhood, chairman of the UK Committee. We have many things that we could discuss about substance abuse. Um, a lot of people may not know this, but I at one time was substance abuse too. That's what actually brought me back to Miami, uh, being the, the street guys that we were, right? Mm -hmm. And um, from one thing to the another, I mean, it started out for us, for me, and I'm quite sure probably you have the same stories, it started out where I needed to make money because I came from a drug-infested family wow. of drug users. And so I started selling to make money, right, because there was no food in the refrigerator, right? <laughs> and so then, eventually, selling I started to use. and. I came down here in March 7th of 1996, um, leaving a heroin addiction. And haven't looked back since, since March 7th, 1996. Haven't looked back since. Um, why the celebration, right? Why the celebration, and I wanna make sure I stay focused. Why the celebration of recovery for you guys? Tell, tell mm -hmm. let's start. Why the celebration of recovery? Why are you guys celebrating your recovery? Well, first of all, I'm celebrating my recovery is because, uh, you know, responsibility comes with recovery. And there's so many uh, uh, things in my life that I need to manage. Mm -hmm. And, well, when I was a kid, it started with alcohol and uh, 14 years old. And it got out of control, and it went on to other drugs, marijuana, cocaine, and everything. And after a while, 50 years old, my life was out of control. It was out of control. Right. And so now I got a child from a, 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 at 50 something years old. He's out there and don't know where the mother is and I'm using drugs, substance. So my life is out of control. So recovery was a way of me getting back 
control of my life. And what I do now is I give back to people that need help. That means I can be able to reach out and, 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 and uh, uh, show recognition to other to people. other people, other yeah. peers that is doing the recovery work in our community and drawing together so we can root out the prevalence of drugs and maybe turn around young kids so, uh, as I was mm -hmm. from drugs, alcohol mm -hmm. dependency. Okay. Your brother, and answer the same question for me, please. Um, well, my name is James Hill. I'm the uh, secretary of the UCAN committee. Mm -hmm. uh, I have actually uh, in July, I was 33 years clean uh, and abstinent from all mood and mind altering chemicals. Right. Uh, and uh, what happened was, even though at, at my at my worst my bottom, so to speak, was the day I came to in a place that I had been arrested before, doing the same thing, thinking the same thoughts, desperate, suicidal, homicidal, and the best I could come up with is I'm gonna go downtown and try to check back into prison. That's how bad it was. I couldn't stop doing what I was, even though I knew what I was doing was killing me, I couldn't stop doing it. Yeah. Right, right. And right, I didn't yeah. understand, uh, and for me, the reason I do this is because I believe that I went all through that, through all of that for a purpose. Amen. And that purpose was to be able to now assist other people who are bewildered. They have no idea what's happening to them uh, and understand how it happened. Um, so that, that I believe my struggle was my gift right. mm. because without challenge, you know, it's like, if you don't go through nothing, you can't grow through nothing. Don't like, go through nothing, can't grow well, through nothing. You know, right. so, like that, right. you know, why God, you know, why Save am you. I going through this? And then some person will come in with that struggle and I'm able to like, just let them know that they're not alone, that I understand. I've been where you are, and, and here's what we can do, you know. So, and it's a process, you know. It really is. I didn't just get high one day and become that person mm -hmm. who, you know, like the next day. No, it, it's a process. It took me a while to pro it progress to that point where I was helpless and homeless and desperate and you know, homicidal and suicide, right. you know, right. reach that point. And so recovery is also a process. Right. And it starts with that slow climb, but that steady it and consistent. Slow climb, steady grind. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's practice, practice, you know, it's just practice, you know, and uh, practice. Make perfect. Manage yeah. your life. It, it don't make perfect, it makes progress. And sense. With the, with the idea of perfection, yeah. That's a very, very, very uh, good point. Brother Levant, Levant, Brother Levant has been quiet. Brother Levant, why do you celebrate, and we're going to go around from, from here. Brother Levant, why do you celebrate your um, recovery. recovery? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I celebrate recovery because... I come from a hopeless state of being. I didn't have any hope. I did things that, um, without going into detail, just say I stole from my family. I stole from the community. I, um, I was with people that I didn't want to be with. No matter how much I made, I always was behind the eight ball. Um, I became willing at a place. I, I always say I went from the Swedes to the, to the outhouse. Um, Sweets to the outhouse? Yeah, to the yeah. outhouse. Man. I went to the outhouse. That's all the way out there. <laughs> I went to the outhouse. So that way, so, some of y'all might not understand the outhouse is yeah. where the houses was built in the country. Yeah, yeah, the bathroom yeah, yeah. wasn't yeah, in the, the house. house. Right. It was in the outhouse. outhouse. Right. You got to go to the outhouse right. to take a dump. 
you know, so that's where I was. I was in the outhouse. And I, somehow or another, I always said, um, the light shining on me one day and they asked me, you know, how do I, why do I always wear black at the time? And I was saying like, apartheid need to be abandoned and this and that, and we are black people all oppressed. And then somebody asked, said, did you sell drugs? And who did you sell drugs to? Mm-hmm. And so I find myself looking at myself and saying, you know, I'm a part of the problem. And as I realized that I was a part of the problem, I became willing to change. And as I, over the years and working in the field of substance dependency, I found out that you have to be willing to share your life and to touch people in um, an intimate way. Mm-hmm. You know, you just can't go to work and just think it's a job. You can't meet people on the street and just think they're going to change their life. You have to meet people where they're at and just tell them about you. And in telling them about you, you're proud of who you are now. Uh, so I'm a proud of who I am now. So that's worth celebrating. So that's why I celebrate mm-hmm. recovery. Okay, okay, hey, okay. Hey, Ungawa. Hey, uh, 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 my name is Chapin Young. Yes. Uh, I, I, you know, grew up in a religious home. Mm-hmm. Uh, father died when I was uh, 11 years old. My, me too. Yeah. He, my father oh, wow. died at 11 too. Wow, yes, he did. That's, uh, I was 11 that's years amazing. old. And, yeah. and, you know, he, uh, you know, my mom said at that time, man, when we was going to the funeral, that you don't understand why, why he had to leave now. But it's that you're going to understand when you get older. And I do understand when you get old. He was a man on the streets. You know, he went through the uh, Korean War. I believe it's the Korean War that messed him up, man, and got in his head. So he brought all that brought all that to the neighborhood. You know, I'm going to make make what I'm going to make, you know, with these eight kids. He had to get out there and do it. So he sold drugs. He did whatever he needed to do. He had little stores here and, and stores there, you know, to cover up that. You know, I grew up in the atmosphere. And, and some of my uh, brothers, you know, was doing the kind of the same thing, running the streets. And and I was about headed in that same direction, you know, as I was getting older. You know, for a little time I did get out there, you know, doing, uh, start use, I started mostly using, you know, because I was a worker, you know. I, I went to work, did whatever I needed to do to get mine, you know, to, to use. And so I began that plight, you know, in, into the drug culture, you know, it was around in the 80s. Late '80s, you know, uh, yeah. did, you know, a lot of things going on in clubs and stuff, and I wanted to do some things in music, and uh, had a little band in the neighborhood, man, that I was trying to sponsor. A band? A band, yeah. I had, okay. I had one of the man best guitar players, a league guitar players I ever seen uh, in the neighborhood. You know, he never really made it to to that. That's when Prince was coming out. He was doing that thing like you had that thing like Prince. Right. Little white guitar man and. And he, he was good. His name was BB. His name was Horace Shelton. We called him BB. His mom called him BB. But anyway, you know, and I wanted to promote, do some things like that. But I, after that drug, I got into that crack. And he was on crack, and the people around me was on crack. And so I was just using it. And and uh, for I knew it, this crack ain't like the marijuana and alcohol. This is something different. You know, this stuff was taking me down, man. It was taking all my attention. You know what I mean? And had my money. You know, I had my self-respect. Yeah. And I got down. Your money. Yeah, man, and it took me down, you know, yeah. to the place where I'm saying, like, why is I'm, I'm living like this? You know, I never envisioned myself being on drugs, alcohol, because I grew up around, oh, they used to call wine hoes, you know, way mm-hmm. back in the day. Yeah. Called wine, they drank yeah. that, that wild average rose and the rum and rocket, you know, I think you're back then. Let's say rum and rocket. Rum and rocket. That's a rum. That's a rum. That's a rum. That's a rum. I grew up around those guys, man, that, that, that sit around and drink that stuff. And I, and I, I used to say, I don't want to be a part of that, not like that. But when I got out there, when I was 18, it was like, okay, you know, I want to party. I want to have some money. I want to go to clubs and stuff. I want some women. And they were drinking and, you know, doing things. And uh, that crack in the late 80s, it, it took me down. And, you know, I, I, I came back to myself, you know, and I, um, I had hope, you know. It was that hope that I had in me that I knew I could do this, do things better in my life. And I changed my life. I went from that dark to that light uh, uh, state in my life. And that's what I, I celebrate. Because I mm-hmm. came from that dark. Yeah. I know what the dark is about. We know what that dark is about. It ain't about nothing. So I came when I came into that light, man, and seemed like this is a better life that, that I can live. And once I really uh, got into the church, see, one thing about you know, drug and alcohol culture, 
it, it's about that neighborhood, and I saw you see is a drug dealer with the new car, the girlfriends, and and, and all all the things that they're doing out in the neighborhood. And to to I got into the church and started seeing black doctors, black lawyers, black business people, black people who are successful, ain't selling no drugs, ain't ain't doing no drugs, ain't doing no crime to make their money, and it blew me up, man. I said I can have this. Also, man, I began to see that, and I began to pursue that, that life and that lifestyle that they had. And that's what, how I went from that darkness to that life. The way I celebrate my brother, the, the, my recovery, is when I go into them jails, Miami, uh, jail, uh, pre-trial release, and I walk in there, and I see them young men in there who like me, like us, and I go in there, I tell them my testimony, how I got free from that stuff and how they can get free from that stuff and how they, they can live their life a better life than what they are living now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I celebrate my recovery. Just mm -hmm. sharing my testimony of how, how I changed my life and how they can change theirs. That's how I celebrate my recovery. Each and, I've been doing for for well, January will be 34 years. What is this Narcan? Let's talk about this right okay. quick. What is this? This product endorsement right here. This is okay. this. <laughs> but it's good. It's yeah, what it is. Yeah, yeah. This is Narcan nasal spray. Okay. Two pack. This is uh, Narcan that we uh, use for our outreach program when we go out on Saturdays and different days. Uh, we just explain to different people in the circle, out of the circle, on how Narcan is distributed. Because of the prevalence of fentanyl and oxycodone, everyone needs to know how to use this product and should uh, really keep this product handy and available uh, uh, for overdoses. Uh, off of fentanyl, overdoses off of uh, uh, oxycodone. And that's what is used for okay. Brother Dre. So, so basically, to put this in layman's term, if somebody ODing off of Life opioid saving. or off of heroin or off mm -hmm. of oxycodone or mm -hmm. from taking pills, you hit them in their nose with this nasal spray and then it'll wake them up and stop them from overdosing. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what it does. Exactly. exactly. That's what it does. That's what it does. And, 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 and okay. one of the things you do, you, you, you when you shoot, when you spray it in a person nose, you also got to make sure you call nine, uh, nine one one because one. this is um, this is, you, and you can do it if the person is not old and you think they are, it won't do any harm. Okay. So so, but if you if someone is old and then you spray it in and you and the don't, it's another one in there. You spray them again. But make sure, make sure you call 911 to rescue, to have the rescue come there to um, assist that person along the way. I'm going to tell you a funny story about this because I just recently saw this being used, right? Wow. Because in my studio, my studio is in Overtown. Okay. So in front, of, um, in front of my studio, a lot of, I'm right there by the bridge, right, where the, 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 the train <laughs> runs. So a lot of times I see a whole bunch of drug users wow. there, you know, and I know their story because I was there. Okay. And so this world. one guy, apparently he must have shot up and um, he fell out in front of the studio. So he was laying there like, right? It's not funny, but what he said afterward to me was like really funny. Cause I was like, you almost died, but. <laughs> yes, yeah. he was like, so the people came to rescue him and when they rescued him, they gave him this because I seen him hit it with it. And he's like, oh, man, y'all done messed up my high. And I was like, Negro, you could have died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and we worked that out. area. We worked that area. Yeah. I was like, you could have, you could have, you could have, you could have, you could have died. Like, and so the funny part about it is when you're on drugs, and I know you were so concerned about that high and getting that high, you don't care about not even your own life. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of the weird. biggest things about substance dependence or uh, drug addiction. When, we, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I was caught up in the grip of my illness, I didn't have the ability to care. Oh, right. Wow. I didn't have the ability to care. Yeah. Yeah. I thought about what I was doing. I didn't want to do what I was doing. But that ability to care and add discipline and add purpose to my life was gone. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this order is um, we got to. It's, 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 it, it takes you. It takes you 
it, it, I call it a secondary psychosis because um, it takes me away from reality. Wow. It yeah. takes me away from what's actually going on, you know. And if you haven't been there, it's hard to explain to someone right, who's never, who never experienced, experienced it. it. Yeah. And if you've been there, it's hard to accept it from someone who never experienced uh-huh. it. Right. It's a, like a double-edged sword. Right. Right. This is why we celebrate it. You know, we got, we got people around this table that been in some of the worst places you can be, mm-hmm. and they found a way out. And the worst place you can be is a hopeless state of mind. Awesome. That's the worst place any human being can be. And these brothers around this table have been there mm-hmm. and they found a way out. Okay, so this this has been, this is excellent. And I want to, y'all brothers are giving me some really good insight. Brother Bernard, you wanted to share why you celebrate your recovery. Yes, uh, I celebrate my recovery because the way I used to be, the troubles and, 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 the, and the problems I caused in the streets, for my family, uh, the, the, the worryation, the crying, the tears that caused my moms. I celebrate my recovery now because I spend every day making my mom smile. I try to make up for those days where she cried, those tears that she shed for me. And uh, I reach out now to youth. You know what I mean? I got a youth group in my church that I'm working with. And uh, I'm leading them and mentoring them as to what not to do. And, and um, I like I like my recovery because someone said James said I can I can reach when someone has a problem like if I run across another addict or someone out there struggling in the streets I can be there because I've been there right so that's why I celebrate my recovery so here is a big big question that I think um, we got to answer that this may be the elephant in the room right. What have your, okay, and we talk about, but let me set this up, right? We talk about how the damage we caused in the street from doing the things we did, the damage that we caused in our community, let's call it our community, right? Mm -hmm. The damage that we caused in our community from past actions of drug addiction uh, and doing wrongful things. What has your recovery recently, now to date, now that you've been in recovery, and I want y'all brothers to think about it, and we're going to see who's going to pick the answer first. What has your recovery done nowadays to help the black community, to help our community? Let me, let me set the stage for it. Uh, I go every day to the drug community, in Overtown mm-hmm. and at the Miami Rescue Mission where most black men are in shelters for drug abuse, mm-hmm. homelessness, and alcoholism. I go over there volunteering at the Miami Rescue Mission right. to help black men. You know, when you help a man that's in substance abuse, and you came from, I came from substance abuse, Mm -hmm. homelessness, and alcohol. So when I see men, black men, I know their their, uh, recovery Mm -hmm. is not just when it comes to alcohol and drugs, it's the recovery toward their family too. Right. Like myself, I had a son. Mm-hmm. I had to reach, I, I had to get my recovery so I can help my son reach back mm-hmm. and bring my son out of, uh, of hopelessness, mm-hmm. out of poverty, out of homelessness. Mm-hmm. So I always uh, 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 bring that when I'm going out to help the uh, uh, men and women in the black community. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I always keep that at the forefront when I'm trying to learn more about uh, getting uh, resources mm-hmm. to help our community. Like I say, 
we go over town, we distribute this here. Mm -hmm. All of these brothers here mm -hmm. have their own stories yeah, let's hear from of them. what they do mm -hmm. in the black community. Let's hear, brother. You know, I, I think the, the biggest impact we could do to help someone is to live their life. Live the life that you are proclaiming. And keep in mind, what has your recovery done for the black community now? Well, my recovery has helped for the black community now. Mm -hmm. It helped me to get me right, then I can go back to the prisons and jail. I... Mm -hmm. Give me some. Okay. Oh, give me some. I thought you give me the hand. No, no, stop. Give me some. Okay, yeah. No, to to, no, to go right to the, the prisons and the jail. That's where my heart and my passion give is. Me some going to, give it to me. Go to the, yeah. That's where we at. That's we in the prisons and jail. I was right. that's what I was gonna do today. Right. But I put it off for, for this. Right. But I go into the prisons and jail and let them guys know, man, that there is some hope. Right. Okay, you can pull yourself up from this. Mm -hmm. Here's some resources, man. Here's a here's a drug center you could go to when you get out. Right. Here's a homeless shelter. You, you see, when a guy get out released from the prison jail, they ain't got no money. Mm -hmm. They can't get no job. Right. They can't get no place to stay. So what they gonna do? They gonna go right back to doing what they were doing to got them into that trouble. Right. I'm trying to break that recidivism rate right, right now mm -hmm. to get these men to see, hey, you can have a better life, but it starts with you. Right. And this is what I'm doing to help the black community, to let the black man know, mostly I can go, go do with the women, I can deal with the youth, but my passion really for that man that's behind those bars, right. black, white, Hispanic, whoever, because they all coming back to our community to do something, right. you know, because all the drugs going through the black community. So I go back there and I'm, I'm trying to get these men to see that they can change their life, they can turn around, mm -hmm. and they can help you know, they, they need to, to learn to help the community help. instead of hurt the community. Gotcha. So that's how we, that's how I personally do helping the community move forward, to helping these men. The man is the head. Right. The man is the leader. Gotcha. If the, the leader ain't in place, okay, the, the rest of the body ain't going to follow gonna nothing follow else. Too. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I had a pastor once told me, he said, Stanley, if you live the life, and you li really live the life, People all in your household will begin to live and, and try to that same right. life it's called that you're proclaiming. Mindset. Mindset. Brother Levon. I, um, we started this, the lead organizer started um, a substance abuse committee mm -hmm. um, about seven years ago. Right. Now. And from that, I came aboard and I thought it was a great way to give back to our community. To be what better way to get a group of brothers that been in the circumstance of hopelessness and go give hope. James has a great idea with how this is going on. He also talked about literacy, how we gotta deal with literacy. He talks about emotional disorder. And so this is what we are gonna do as as an organization, our com committee of an organization. Circle Brotherhood is sitting out this committee to address the trauma in the black community. That's yes. how we're gonna do it. Amen. Right. Good brother here, that's to my right. Oh man, that is a, that's a, you know, I, I, I've written four chapters in my head since you asked that question. <laughs> and this is something that I'm sure we could do a whole series. Yes, we, we could. could. We're gonna do it, we could do more. Question. We could do more, we could do more. We're gonna do, I know, like this, I like oh, the feeling. Man, I like so the feeling much, of this, yeah. I like yeah. the feeling. There's so much in that question and, I, and I'm really gonna try to condense it and, and I wish there was a, a a word or a phrase that I could just capsulize all of it but that's not possible you know uh, I think the biggest thing is to educate that's what I can do mm -hmm. uh, I didn't just recover from addiction but I went back and looked you know, this is what I do. You know, I go back, I look historically at all of the different approaches to, you know, uh, to you know, this and helping my community to understand what it is that we're up against. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't define the problem, there ain't gonna be no solution. That's right. Uh, the first step in solving any problem is defining it. You know, I don't care what model you use, what, you know, um, and so when I say that, let me give you an example. I was talking to a bunch of young guys uh, at this place where I go, these 
these kids are there, they on the verge. It, 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 you know, some of them are already in the juvenile justice system. Some of them are right there because they follow us. And, they, and you, know, they, you know what I mean? And, and, I'm, and I'm trying to talk to them, but I notice like none of them can look me in the eye. Mm -hmm. None of them. Talking about 15, 16, 17 wow. year old boys. Mm -hmm. About to be men. Yes, mm -hmm. they, ain't, they ain't trying to look at This is what I got. I ask a question, this is what I get. Twisting mm. yeah. their head, yeah. yeah. That's you it. know, yeah. I mean, uh, some of that can be attributed to adolescence mm. and, you know, there's just human growth and development, but. Mm. That is a it's, big deal. It's, but I, I don't see the same thing in non black children. Mm -hmm. They be willing to answer. Yeah. yeah, I ask the kids, I ask each one, how do you feel? They can't articulate their feelings. And so underneath that, that, that inability to articulate their feelings is this anger because they feel less than. They, they know that they should be able, they look around, they can see, but this, and that, there's that anger, that aggression comes out. And, yeah. and, and how they express that, you know, we see, you know, here, here's the, we're getting a little deeper now. We, the, you know, like, but the symptom is drug, is drug use, gun violence. gun violence. It's that aggression okay, coming. Early, what else to do? Early childhood. Yeah. What early, else to early, do? Early, early I'm early. reacting to trauma. Uh -huh. You know, so we act, we're retracting the trauma as a. And so I think my contribution is to be that voice. All right. You know, is to be that voice. You know, not the popular voice mm -hmm. all the time. Right. No. But to be that voice. But so. progress. Right. comes only when we have honest discussions. Mm -hmm. And you can't have an honest discussion if a voice is missing. That's right. Absolutely. Or we're not listening to it. Let's go to brother, because time is running down. Uh, Let's go to brother. Um, the, the question was, um, what, what, since I've gotten in my recovery, what have I did differently for, 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 for the community? Enhancing the community. Make okay, it uh, that's, that's the easy answer. Um, number one, um, I give back to the community by going through the brotherhood. Uh, I mentor young young men, like James said, I want to be the voice. Um, I, I, I can provide jobs for, for people now, uh, housing, because I house um, veterans that are, that are uh, returning to a society with, with drug addiction, mental illness. Uh, we specialize in those, those type of patients. Um, and uh, I pray for the community. Mm. Yeah. That's it, pray. Mm. That, that's that's tight. That's um, tight. That yeah. you. So we got two minutes left on the interview. Right, quick. Give me one second, there, because we got two minutes left. And I want to talk about you can, all right, the network. Um, where is it located? How can people become a part of it? I got a couple of brothers who I want to introduce y'all to. Well, I got one gentleman I want to introduce you to, uh, introduce to this program. But let's tell the people, um, how could they become a part of this? How can they gain access to this or receive help from it? Uh, the best way that you can be a member of Black Men Solving Our Own Community Problems, you can is a part of that through the Circle of Brotherhood. You can uh, come to our meetings every Tuesday night at 6.30, and you can take out an application to become a Circle of Brotherhood member, and that automatically, uh, as being a member, you are entitled to be a part of the UCAN organization. Now, let me ask the person, Brother Dennis, do they have to necessarily be members of the Brotherhood yes. in order yes. to get? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. But outside of that, you outside of that, can you recommend somebody who is non-members of Brotherhood, like? treatment centers and assist yeah. people yes. yes okay yes we okay. we we do that we as well. we 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 as a collective we know we advocate for those persons that need that don't have a voice and need resources excellent because but, we operate as a as a unit, so yes. yeah, that wealth and knowledge would be So there. one of the things we, we, we do is we build on what we have. So mm -hmm. when someone says they're ready to go get help, it's like we would need to be able to place that person right there and connect right. that person with somewhere where they can get some help at. Right. So therefore, that's what we do. That's another part of our committee. We build 
uh, network of entities or uh, organizations where we can place people at that wants help right then. Yes. Because if I'm asking for help right now, tomorrow, I might not I, be I might here. Yeah, yeah, I, I might not be here. Not. Not. And I'm sincere right. and I want to help right at this now. Moment, right. And right. even tomorrow, yeah. I'm going to want that help, but I got an illness, and like right. I said, that's right. going to disconnect that me from baby. reality, right. so I'm going to be gone. Right. So that's good to know we have this in our community. My brotherhood, Circle of Brotherhood, we're going to wrap this interview up, but we want to thank you for your time. And I'm going to tell you something. This felt good for me. I want to do this again. Yeah, let's do it again. Yeah, we need, we need to get in depth with it. Yeah. All right, so when we do it again, we're going to ask the rest of these questions, and we're going to just keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Yeah. All right, y'all, we want to thank y'all for watching. And uh, keep watching Peace. Circle of Brotherhood Solving Our Own Community Problems. But this particular group, this subcommittee, is called the United Community Assistance Network, uh, also known as You Can When You Believe You, you Can. can.